This story is from Carolyn. Here's what she writes. I was born the youngest of six children in a small Connecticut town. We had a couple of dogs and a whole lot of cats that my siblings and I looked after. Since they were all quite a bit older than me, it wasn't long until they'd all gone off to college or gotten married and moved out, and that left me to care for the animals alone. By the time I was 12, we were down to just one dog. He was a Norwegian elk hound with a strong pull. Every day I walked him, or maybe he walked me, through the woods behind our house to the tobacco fields far from the road where I could turn him loose and let him run. It was a huge tract of land, owned in part by members of my family and mostly surrounded by neighboring shrub and tobacco farms. At 12, I was finally allowed to go alone on these daily walks. I wasn't afraid. We had no black bears to speak of back then, and the coyotes seemed to stay away. And I'd never seen a bobcat. A few years later, while I was in high school, I encountered a mountain lion back there. They've only recently acknowledged their presence in my state. But all in all, I had no fear of anything, so I would often take off on my own with the dog. Norwegian elk hounds are a medium-sized dog, the sort of compact version of a husky. They're known for hunting in packs and bringing down moose and bear. My dog took advantage of my female build and lack of strength to pull extra hard and practically drag me through the woods. Nevertheless, I started taking him to the fields every afternoon. We walked up the wooded hill alongside my house and wound our way on a well-worn path and continued on the thicket and more woods until we got to the fields. Every day when we got to the top of the hill, which was about halfway on our journey to the fields, I would hear a strange knocking sound. In the quiet of the woods, I would hear a long tree cracking and then it would be followed by three knocks. I thought it must be a woodpecker, and so I shrugged it off. After a while, I noticed that the tree knocking only started when I stepped foot on a particular part of the path. I never suspected that Bigfoot was anything more than what I had read about in books about the Loch Ness Monster and other cryptids, and it never occurred to me that that was what it could be. But day after day, walk after walk, when we reached that one specific spot on the trail, I would hear exactly three knocks, and then I would go on my way without incident. Pretty soon, though, my happy-go-lucky, hardy, and hard-pulling dog stopped trying to ease so far ahead of me. He became clingy, hugging my side until we got out of the area. Sometimes I could hear something moving around in the woods, but I always thought it was some deer watching me or some other critter. And it was definitely watching me. I could feel it. The footsteps of whatever was making the noise were moving toward me as well, not away from me. And once I stopped, and the footsteps stopped. And when I moved, it moved. And when I stopped again, so did it. Still, I wasn't afraid. I was sure it was a deer. I didn't realize back then that deer don't track people, and my dog continued to look petrified. As I got older and joined our high school's cross-country track team, I used that same route to get in some extra practice. Sometimes I brought my flute with me, and when I got to the top of the hill before the descent into the fields, I'd lean up against what we call the big tree that grew there and play freestyle for an hour. Each time I passed by that one spot, I would hear three knocks. I didn't know to look or listen for Sasquatch, so it was quite a while before I realized there were specifically three knocks. Eventually, the pattern became hard not to notice. I started to believe there were forest spirits, more along the lines of ghosts rather than Bigfoot. I somehow knew intuitively that those three knocks were not for me. They were about me. It was as if they were telegraphing the arrival of the human into the area. One winter day, I went up the hill to take pictures of icicles on bushes for my photography class. 
It was my dream back then to become a National Geographic photographer. I was enjoying pretending that I already was one as I flopped down in two feet of snow on my belly to get the right angle for my shots. And as I did so, I noticed an odd and increasingly familiar smell that reminded me of really strong cat urine. Sometimes the smell was there and sometimes it wasn't. But when it was, it was always exactly where the tree knocks happened. I began to look around for cougar tracks. At that point, I had already seen the cougar that lived back there. and I hadn't noticed that there were big, deep tracks all around me. But now, I was paying attention. I put each of my feet inside a paw print to see how big this cougar was. The stride was my whole height of five feet. There was also a long, straight mark alongside the prints, which I assume must have been its tail dragging. I was so excited because now I could show my mother and prove to her that I really did see a mountain lion up there. So I ran back to the house and I got her. And she took one look at the tracks and with a funny expression on her face, she said, I don't think those are cougar tracks. And then that awful smell came back and she remarked about it. Her eyes got big and she said, I don't think we need to stay here. Looking back, I think she knew something she didn't reveal. She tried to dissuade me from following the tracks, but I was determined. She went home and I went tracking. And I followed them past a bunch of tobacco sheds to a swamp. They led right up to the swamp and then they ended. Things felt odd. It was unnaturally quiet. A ghostly steam rose off the frozen black water. The remains of a couple of old cars from the 1950s poked out here and there, as if they were reaching out for salvation against the encroaching decay of the hungry swamp. The woods felt as if they were encircling me, closing in and reaching out their gnarled limbs to wrap around me and throw me in the cars. Call it intuition, or maybe panic. Whatever it was, I felt like the cougar must be lingering near and watching me. So I turned around and I ran home. There definitely was a cougar living in that area. I'd seen it with my own eyes. But it wasn't until years later that I realized what I followed that day could not have been cougar tracks. I hadn't paid attention to the fact that it was not a set of four tracks, but it was two feet. The imprint I had taken to be the cougar's tail was probably made by someone dragging a stick. My earliest Bigfoot encounters went on for six years, and I was oblivious to them. Only after I saw a Bigfoot did I start to research them and finally interpret my childhood experiences correctly. I often think how lucky I was that I wasn't attacked, and I've since encountered those who were aggressive. I also can't help but wonder what my silent, hidden audience must have thought of my flute playing. And that's the end of her email, and now now I want to know about these visual sightings and the aggressive encounters. Carolyn, Carolyn, you have got to fill us in on the rest of this. I'm going to look through my emails and make sure that I don't have other emails from you, but this was fantastic. Very well written, very colorfully written, especially your description of the swamp area and the cars. I really appreciate those prose and (laughs) those descriptions. I love real flowery writing. Flowery, flowery, I can't even say it. Colorful writing. How about that? Thank you, Carolyn, for this story, and I hope to hear from you again. Thank you, ma'am. Hey, guys, I hope you enjoyed that story. My name is Cameron Buckner, and this is the Dixie Cryptid YouTube podcast, which is also broadcast across the podcast network as the What If It's True podcast. You can search any podcast app that you use, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, any of them. Do a search for What If It's True Podcast, and it should pop up right at the top. And if you'd click the follow button or subscribe button on that, it really helps me on the podcast network. Father's Day is coming up on June the 19th. 
you've got plenty of time to go to yetibars.net and do a search of all the cool soaps and deodorants and salves and lotions they have. And in one click, you can get Father's Day out of the way. I'm sure it'll be to you if you order in the next couple of three days. It'll be to you way ahead of time. You can wrap it up and give it to your favorite dad, husband, brother, whoever you buy Father's Day for, and they will absolutely love it. Yeti Bars is running a sale right now for Father's Day. Plus, when you check out, use the code DC10 and get an additional 10% off. Go check them out, yetibars.net or Yeti Bars on Facebook. You won't be sorry. Let's get back into this podcast. All right, here we go. The writer of this email, her name is Sue, and here's what she writes. When I was 20 years old, I went to work in the clothing mill. After a few years of working in the winding room, I was transferred to the print works. On second shift, it would get really hot in that room, so while they were shut down and cleaning the machine between batches, I would go out into the cool air and catch a breath. One night in November of 1972, as I was standing outside, I saw something out of the corner of my eye that was coming around the building. I turned to see a circular object that was a hundred feet in diameter. It was flat on the bottom, it had a dome on the top, and it was flashing colored lights that spun around and rotated with the spin of the craft. There was a dark hole in the center of the bottom. It was a clear night with lots of stars in the sky, except where the craft blocked them out. I want to make it clear that I have never done drugs, nor have I consumed alcohol or even so much as smoked a cigarette. This was not an hallucination. I had never seen anything like this before. I wouldn't even have known what I was looking at if I hadn't watched the day the earth stood still. This craft was only about 40 feet off the ground and it was moving slowly. It didn't make a sound, not even a whooshing sound. It was quiet in the building, so there was nothing to drown out any of the noise. I'd have heard it if this thing made any sounds. It crossed my field of view, and I yelled for a co-worker to come out and see it, too. He was a retired Air Force officer. He said he'd never seen anything like it either, and we watched as it drifted along and followed the river in a northerly direction toward Greenville, South Carolina. When I got home that night, my husband told me a flying saucer had been spotted over Greenville around 11 p.m. I had seen it at 10 p.m., so it took an hour to reach Greenville. I told him I had seen it too, and he laughed at me. He was an abusive man who laughed at me and made fun of me all the time for being a simple country girl. Sometimes he hit me when he was angry. It was a stressful marriage, so I didn't pursue a conversation. He worked third shift, so he had to leave for work anyway. The next day, he came home all excited. He'd driven down the road that paralleled the river the craft had followed, and he'd seen it too. I thought that was strange. Had it come back? He said a bright pulsating light was hovering above the tree, so he stopped and turned off his lights. And he watched it for a few minutes and then turned his lights back on, and it shot straight up into the sky and disappeared but it didn't stop there. That same week, I had the oddest dream. I dreamed I was floating out the door and up the dirt road we lived on. There was a big circular object hovering over the road that I was being drawn to, and I could see a wide light coming out of the bottom, and it seemed like there were bodies standing under the craft waiting for me. Then, I started feeling like I was spinning, or maybe I was feeling extremely dizzy. Either way, it felt like I was spinning around really fast, like I was in the spin cycle of a washing machine. And then I found myself sitting on a table in a white room that appeared to circle around me. There were machines that looked to me at the time like vending machines. We didn't know about computers back then, but later I came to realize that's what they looked like. 
A man dressed in white pointed at the machines and asked me what I wanted. I want a hamburger, I said. Yeah, I know how funny that sounds, but that's what I told him, and a hamburger popped out of one of the chutes. I don't remember eating it. The man stuck me in the arm with a needle, and the next thing I remember, he was showing me around the ship. We were standing at a long curving window, and I realized we were not on Earth anymore. We were speeding through space. We stopped in midair, and I found myself looking at these tall twin buildings in a place I'd never heard of. He said there were going to be changes on Earth, but he didn't elaborate on what those changes were going to be. Mostly, he warned me of my predicament. He said that I would have to change myself because the life I was living had no future. I don't remember anything after that. The next morning, I was back in my own bed. I thought about that dream and how real it felt. At 3 p.m., I headed to work. And as I drove down the road where I had seen the craft in my dream, I thought to myself, this is where it happened. And then I looked up into the sky and there it was again. It had a bright silver bottom that sparkled in the sunlight. And as I watched it, it shot straight up into the clouds and out of sight. I only trusted a few people enough to share this story with in the past. And then only because they had shared with me something that had happened with them. The more UFO stories I hear, though, the more I realize the UFOs are getting bigger and bigger, like motherships coming down to Earth. I don't know what's going to happen to us, but it's getting to be a bit scary to think about. After that first dream, I've had several experiences when I would wake up in the middle of the night feeling as if I were being pulled up to the ceiling. It was so scary, and I would think, Jesus, help me, just help me. And then I would float back down to my bed and feel loving hands rubbing my face. That's no joke. It really happens. I don't think all of these alien creatures are evil, but I know these last ones trying to abduct me felt evil. No, I'm not insane, nor am I out there as some people call it. I have several degrees in various technical courses, and I manage my own business for years. And though I am retired now, I still try to get out and work as much as I can. I built my own house by myself and it looks amazing. The funny part is that I built it in a Bigfoot hotspot. I've caught them on my game cameras and I have many casts of their footprints. My life has been a really amazing story. Thank you for reading it. Oh, what a good story. I I know this sounds, your story is fascinating. And it's, uh, I don't know if this bothers you, these experiences bother you, or these dreams bother you, but apparently you're grounded in your faith, and you you cry out to the Lord, and he seems to help you. You said he rubs your face. And I should really concentrate on that, but I'm wondering, you were married to a guy who was physically and verbally abusive to you, and I'm wondering, apparently you're not with him anymore. That may have been the big change coming in your life. I have no idea what goes on in your life, and I probably shouldn't even be guessing. But I hope you're not still with that guy. You built your own house by yourself. You say you did a great job on it. I assume if you were married, your husband would have helped you build the house. So I'm going to guess and rest in the tension that you're free of all that, and hopefully you were free of that soon after all that stuff started because women shouldn't be treated that way. All that said, thank you very much for this great story. I love these UFO stories and these some kind of contact with some kind of entity, possibly from another planet or galaxy or even universe. I don't know. I don't know what to think about all this. I just wish I could have an experience like that. I just want to see one of these cool spacecraft. And if I have to wonder what it is the rest of my life, that's fine. I just want to see one. Okay, enough talking. Let's go to another story. This email was sent to me anonymously. I don't know who the writer is. I live on Fort Hill overlooking Charleston, West Virginia. Over the last 35 years, I've heard Bigfoot screams many times. On cold winter nights, the dogs up on this hill will start barking until a terrible scream echoes down across the valley and silences them. 
I've heard tree knocks up here, screaming as if a woman is being murdered, and whoops and jabbering like humans talking, but not human. This seems to happen most often around the 4th of July. I guess that's because of all the fireworks disturbing the creatures deep in the woods. I've heard these same sounds on the internet listed under Sasquatch, Sabe, and Bigfoot. In 2018, my oldest son and a few of his friends were shooting off fireworks in a parking lot in a neighboring town not too far from our home. When they got there around 10 p.m., they decided to walk to the top of the hill where there was a water reservoir. They reasoned that they'd be far away from any homes at the top of that hill and they could shoot the fireworks high into the air there. Besides, if anything went wrong, they figured they had an immediate water source. They walked up this hill through the dark woods with only their flashlight to guide them. It had rained that afternoon and a low fog was hanging in the air. The path was paved with asphalt with gravel on both sides. The boys took turns carrying the box while the girls were busy walking and talking in the front. There was a fork in the path halfway up that hill and one fork leads straight up on the hill while the other stays low and wraps around the reservoir. The girls took the wrong fork. The boys weren't paying attention. As they continued down the wrong path, they began to hear someone walking over in the woods. My son realized they should have reached the reservoir by then, so he told the girls to stop. Don't be silly, they told him. We'll be there soon. They pointed out that they'd stayed on the path and kept walking. My son is a high-functioning autistic. He thinks a little bit different than others. He said, I hear somebody walking behind us, walking in the gravel. Look, y'all, I'm scared. I want to go home. Someone in the group suggested they shoot off the fireworks where they were, that they'd gone far enough, and the girls agreed. My son said, I think this is a bad idea. We need to get home now. The other kids laughed at him and called him a scaredy cat. They pulled out one of the coffee can-sized fireworks and they lit it. It spewed on for about two minutes, sparkling and lightning and popping and crackling. And finally it went out and everything went silent and dark. And from the woods, they heard a low growl. See, I told you he wouldn't like it, my son said. It's time to go. We gotta go now. The boys hurriedly picked up the box while the girls were screaming. They all went running back down the hill, leaving my son behind in the dark. And he heard the growl again. I'm sorry, mister, he said. It was their idea to set it off in your house. Now I'm going to start walking and I'm going to leave your house now and I'm sorry for disturbing you. I'm going to go now. I did not mean to dishonor you. And the growling stopped. My grandfather told me about the old man of the mountain when I was just a little girl. He taught me about the old ways and what to do when being confronted by a Sasquatch. Don't make eye contact. Speak loudly, but be non-confrontational. Be respectful, but don't show fear. And do not run, no matter what. That's exactly what my son did. He told me that the Sasquatch followed him down the mountain, keeping about 10 feet back. He could hear it walking in the gravel. He used his cell phone to light his way, but he never looked back. And when he got to the car, the others were yelling for him to hurry. It's right behind you, they said. But my son continued his slow, steady pace to the car, and he never once looked back. He got into the car, and as they sped out of the parking lot, He caught sight of it in the headlights. It was standing at the edge of the path, swaying back and forth. He said it was nine feet tall and it was covered in black hair, and its arms were longer than a human, and it had green eye shine. When the other kids dropped my son off, they were all nervous. The girls were crying. They were all talking over each other, trying to tell me what happened, but my son was calm and sober, like a priest. I sent the other kids home and I had my son recount his story. And I believe every word of it. Oh wow, what a great story. An autistic kid caught out in the woods shooting fireworks by a Bigfoot. 
He sure did a good job getting out of there by not running and not being confrontational. That's, I guess that's the way he made it out. Who knows if this thing would have hurt him otherwise, but it was just escorting him out. What a great story. Just a fantastic story. Thank you to the writer for sending it. Here is a paranormal story, and the writer didn't give his name, and that's fine. Some time back, two friends and I spent the weekend with another friend who managed a pub in the Midlands in the United Kingdom. That's about a two and a half hour drive from where I live in Liverpool. We arrived just before closing and we went inside. I looked around and saw the walls were decorated with various items that included some of those old brass bugles and cart horse tack. There were a couple of barmaids working. One was bringing drinks to the table and the other was clearing tables. Sean, our friend who managed the pub, led us over to the bar and we were standing there talking when the barmaid who was cleaning the tables came over to us and announced that she'd found the mouthpiece. That statement didn't make sense to us, so Sean explained that the building was home to two ghosts. One was forever stealing the mouthpiece from one of the brass bugles, and the other would slam doors shut throughout the night. It was a good tale, but I don't know that we fully believed him yet. Last orders was announced, and the pub soon emptied, leaving my friends and me waiting at the bar for Sean to complete his closing duties. When we refilled our glasses and headed up to the top floor where Sean's living quarters were, as we were about to ascend the last flight, Sean tapped me on the shoulder and nodded down the corridor. There were three doors along this corridor that were all shut, but at the end was one door that wasn't shut and it was half open. I followed Sean's gaze to that door and I watched in fascination as it slowly and smoothly, without so much as a jerk, closed with a gentle click as it latched. This gave me goosebumps, and Sean just smiled and led the way up the final flight to his flat. We were having a good visit with Sean and his girlfriend, but it wasn't long until it was time to go back downstairs and refill our glasses. No one was moving, so I volunteered. It took me a while to find my way in the dark, and I managed to get through the kitchen and refill four pint glasses plus an orange juice for Sean's girlfriend. I don't mind telling you that my thoughts were on that mouthpiece and the slowly closing door. I knew I'd have to find my way back upstairs, and that didn't help much either. As I got to the landing before the last flight, I couldn't resist stopping and looking down that corridor where I'd seen the gently closing door. I was concentrating on the door I'd seen close earlier when suddenly something began banging. The other three doors slammed shut hard. I was jolted into action. You can call me a wimp if you like, but I ran up those stairs as fast as my feet would take me. I couldn't reach Sean's door fast enough. And I'll admit that I never lost sight of my priorities, though. I never spilled a drop of beer. Woo! That is what I was going to ask you. Did you spill any of the beer? When I was younger, a bunch of guys and I went out to Colorado. We were in Breckenridge, I think, and there was about six or eight of us, and we rented a condo. We were having a good time after a great day of skiing, And one of the guys who uh, was with us had had a little too much to drink. He had a can of beer in his hand. It was open. There was a spiral stair coming down from a loft. And somehow he got his feet twisted up and he rolled down that spiral stair. And when he got to the bottom, and I don't know how he did it, but he made it all the way to the bottom. And his beer was totally full. He had just popped the top on it. and His beer was totally full. We talk about that story all the time because, like the writer of this story, he never lost sight of his priorities. He didn't spill a drop of that beer. Anyway, this was a great story, great paranormal story to the writer. Thank you for sending it. If you're listening to the Dixie Cryptid podcast on YouTube, 
The next three stories are taken from my What If It's True podcast. They were originally uploaded to that podcast on the podcast network, and they've never been included on the Dixie Cryptid channel, and so that's what I'm doing, bringing a few over at a time. So you can hear some of these cool stories that we did at the What If It's True podcast. So that's what, if you've heard them before, if you follow the What If It's True podcast, I don't want you to waste your time. But for people who haven't heard them, that's what you're about to hear. The following story is from the book Spooks, Kooks, and Family by Joe Coombe. You can find the book on Amazon by doing a quick search, Spooks, Kooks, and Family. I've actually read the book and it's quite interesting and entertaining. So if you're interested in a good ghost story book, please look up Mrs. Coombe's book. This chapter of the book is entitled The UFO. Although not strictly a ghost story, this is a story that both my parents loved to retell again and again over the years. It affected them profoundly. One of my brothers was six weeks old at the time. I can pinpoint the date to around mid-October of 1958. The place was a small village called Cumberford, not far from Leakfield. As it was a clear early evening and had been one of those beautiful autumn days we all dream about, my parents decided, as it was such a lovely day, to take a walk to the local pub. It was about a mile and a half up the lane. They set off with the baby in the pram, and my two-year-old brother sat on top of the pram in one of those chair attachments they used in those days. They stayed for a drink or two and sat at the garden outside the pub with the kids. Afterwards, on the walk back down the lane, they decided to stop in a gateway and both of them were star spotting with my dad pointing out the constellations to my mother. They had spotted the Great Bear, the Orion constellation, when my mother looked again and was surprised to see a portion of the sky completely black with no stars at all. She pointed this out to my dad, and they were both trying to work out what it was, as there were no clouds in the sky whatsoever. After standing in the gateway, Dad leaned on the gate. They watched this black patch for a few minutes and were startled to see it suddenly become illuminated. It was a massive wheel of light, and the lights were going around and around the wheel shape. As they both stood there transfixed, a number of smaller lights were seen to come out of the main wheel and fluttered about the sky. My dad, being much braver of the two, or the most stupid, thought it would be a good idea to take his torch out and start flashing his light at the ship in the sky. My mother nearly wet herself with fear when he did this. She grabbed the pram and started hightailing it down the lane back towards the house. My dad gave it a final flash, at which point all the smaller points of light shot back into the main ship and it suddenly sped off into the distance at such a speed my dad had trouble keeping up with it with his eyes. My mother had stopped when he shouted and was just in time to catch it speeding off into the distance. They talked about it all the way home and until late into the evening. They eventually concluded that nobody would believe them anyway, so they decided not to tell anyone. Indeed, they kept this pact right up until one night when I was about 10 years old. I hadn't been born at the time of the events, and they both came out with this amazing story. They were quite shy about it at first, but then got quite animated and were finishing each other's sentences confirming the series of events, and they had us kids spellbound with the story. In 1999, I had a similar sighting. I was with my dad at the time. My mother passed away in 1995. We were standing outside in the back of our house in total darkness. It would have been around November, again looking at the night sky, checking out the constellations, when, out of the corner of my eye, I could see something moving. I mentioned it to Dad, and we were both spellbound by the sight of a classic triangular craft with a light on each point. 
flying low and totally silent over our heads. It was massive. We couldn't believe our eyes. We are on the flight path to Bristol Airport, so we know what planes look like and sound like, and this wasn't any type of plane we had seen. I have not told too many people for the usual reason, the ridicule. It wasn't a V-2 Vulcan bomber, which is the usual go-to for the common or garden skeptic. How do I know? I've seen the V-2 several times flying low and slow at the air show where we live. If it had been a V-2, it would have rattled the windows out of their frames and the teeth from our heads. The noise would have had everyone out on the street when in fact what we saw was totally silent. It glided slowly overhead and disappeared off towards the west. We were both totally godsmacked. I think the story that convinced me there is more to this than meets the eye was an encounter that happened on West Quantuckshed in the 80s. A man in his 60s was walking his dog on the moorland around this area of the Quantucks. He was startled to see an almost black, dark gray, shiny, triangular craft in the distance. He thought it must be a new type of military jet until it rushed up to just above his head and it stopped. He said it was the size of two double-decker buses side by side, quite large. He was so frightened, he just stood there and he didn't move a muscle. It suddenly flew off, totally silent and at great speed. He didn't tell anyone, not even his wife, for fear that nobody would believe him. It wasn't until a few days later when he started noticing his face was burning red and so were his hands. His face began to blister and he went to his doctor who could find no other cause for it. It was only at this point that he made a tentative contact with the B-U-F-O-R-A whom he swore to secrecy. He still hadn't admitted it to his wife at this point. They were able to interview him, anonymously of course, and arrange for him to have treatment for his radiation burns, for that's what they turned out to be. It was only at this point that he told his wife. He was worried that she might have come in contact with radioactivity in the course of washing his clothes. To date, this report remains anonymous. Why would anyone make something like this up? to include radiation burns? When you stop to think about it, though, what an amazing way to explore another world. Fly all over it at will, being seen by thousands every night, and yet nobody actually believes you are real. Because to that society, you are a joke. Couldn't have made that up, could you? To the total skeptic, I will say this. UFOs absolutely exist. Of that, there is no doubt. It is what they are and what they represent now that is up for debate. My name is Ray. I'm almost 80 and I live in Texas. Back in the 1940s, I lived with my mother and father in Northern California. They owned a sporting goods store on Clear Creek, the largest lake in California at the time. My parents loved to hunt and fish, and I grew up in that environment. I knew how to fish and handle a rifle long before I could ride a bicycle. My dad was a tough, no-nonsense outdoorsman. His father, my g was born in Valley View, Texas in 1867. g was a qualified sharpshooter in the Army. He was friends with Bill Cody, among other notables of the West. G. Paul taught my dad everything he knew. My mother was a crack shot, too. I never had to go far to learn about the outdoors or how to gather food. My parents were amazing people, and I was fortunate to be raised by these fun-loving people. Their favorite hunting area was in Modoc County on the Oregon State Line. This was wild country back then, and to see bears and mountain lions was common. I was also influenced by some of Dad and Mom's friends. Two friends in particular were also business people on the lake who had the same interests, 
they enjoyed hunting together. One gentleman was a Texas cowboy who had turned rock mason at the end of the great cattle drives. His name was Mabe Cohn. I thought Mabe was great. He always had stories to tell around the campfire. Mabe's wife, Lil, and their dog, Inky, would come with the group on our hunting trips. The other friend was named Bill Rose. I don't know what his real name was. He was a Russian who had fled his country during the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917. He had hunted bear in Russia. Bill had come to the United States with his new freedom and built a fishing resort on Clear Lake with his bare hands. He built a nice little business for himself, and he loved his new home. The Russian had a dog, too, and that dog's name was Bozo. I remember that dog not being very friendly. He would bite you. The winters of 1947 and 48 and 49 were bitter cold and hard. To get to our campsite for the hunts, we were forced to drive old logging roads into the mountains. These roads were abandoned after the timber was taken, and they had not been maintained in 50 years. The frozen roads were helpful. Had they not been frozen, we would have not made it to the campsite. Four-wheel drives were scarce after the war, and we didn't have one. So we would chain up the tires, and as long as the roads were frozen, we were able to get where we needed to go. The next day, we were up long before daylight as Dad shook two inches of fresh snow off the oil tarp covering of our bedrolls to expose the inviting warmth of a roaring fire and the smell of fresh steaming coffee and hot biscuits. I was a kid, and I could eat my weight in those biscuits. With a full belly of biscuits, we began our mile walk to the area where we were to hunt that day. We wanted to get to our stands and be set up before daylight. The thermometer hung around zero when we left camp. There was no such thing as insulated boots and jackets back then. We just had wool shirts, socks, gloves, and long johns under Levi's and blanketed lined coats. But we were able to stay warm. Lil was on one stand, a Russian was on another, and my mom and me on the third. Dad and Mabe with Inky split up and they drove on foot about three square miles of brush and timber toward the trails going to our stands. Mom and I sat as still as long as we could through the break of dawn. You know, that's the coldest time of day just before sunrise, and boy, was it cold. Finally, it was too cold to sit still at all, and we got up from the big old log that we were sitting on and we moved around a little, hoping it would warm us up a bit. I looked around for fresh deer tracks, but there were none, nor had there been some for some time. There was nothing in the fresh snow. It was then I spotted something in the snow from the previous night, slightly uphill from the log. I walked over to investigate. I saw tracks that looked like humans walking on bare feet in the snow. One set was the size of my dad's size 12 boot tracks, and one was much smaller. Neither wore shoes. You could count all the toes. I couldn't wrap my mind around this. I called to my mother and I said, come look at these tracks. She slowly wandered over to where I was and stood there staring at the snow-covered ground. After a moment or two, she raised her Winchester from the crook of her arm and she jacked around in the chamber and she set the hammer. She grabbed me by the arm and she pulled me away from the tracks and told me to sit back down on the log as she nervously scanned the timber around us. I asked her what the tracks meant, but she said nothing and held a finger to her lips as a sign to be quiet. Two hours later, Mabe and Dad returned. Dad took one look at my mother and he immediately asked, Okay, what's wrong? She took him over and showed him the tracks, and then she said, Explain these, please. He looked at the tracks for a moment and then turned, shrugging his shoulders without saying anything. That was very unlike him. Mr. Cohn walked up with Inky. He sensed the tension and asked if everything was all right. Mom grabbed his arm and took him over to the tracks, and she said, Will you explain these? Because he's got nothing to say about it referring to my father. 
I noticed Inky starting to run up to where they were standing, sniffing the ground. When he approached the tracks, it looked like something slapped him in the face. He almost flipped over backwards, getting away from the tracks. He tucked his tail, ran off, and he laid down. I had never seen him act that way before. Mr. Cone said, let's get on back to camp, and I could sure use some hot coffee. For the rest of that trip, the incident was not discussed in my presence. When I asked how somebody would be walking around barefooted so far up in those mountains away from any town in that cold weather, Mom would only say, I don't know. The term Bigfoot didn't exist in the 1940s, but looking back many years later, there was no other answer. Even 30 years later, when there was so much talk of such things, they wouldn't discuss it at all. I believe now the tracks that we saw were a mother and a small child, Bigfoot. They led straight into the seven-foot-high thicket of Manzanita. There was no way a human could penetrate that stuff. It was an amazing mass of thick red limbs with pointed broken points that were dangerous, but it would seem these two navigated it with ease. Interestingly, we never went back to that area to hunt again. Five years later, we were in those same mountains, but hunting a different area. I was old enough to acquire a hunting license by that time, and I was given my own hunting stand. As usual, we walked in before daybreak, and each of us were dropped off at our stands. It was at the edge of a clearing that was about 150 yards wide. I followed a trail along the edge of the clearing to a point where three trails met. 25 yards up a steep incline off to my left was a huge stump of an old-growth spruce tree left from the logging days 60 years before. It had to have been 7 foot in diameter. It met the ground on the uphill side and was 8 feet high on the downhill side. It was backed up to a large, thick growth of jack pines 10 feet high and 30 or 40 feet wide. It was the perfect stand. I scrambled up the hill and out on the edge of that stump, and I hung my legs off the lower edge, overlooking the trails in the clearing. Perfect camouflage from the jack pines behind, and a great high view below. There had to be a big old Roman-nosed mule deer buck in my future that day, and I was excited. It wasn't really cold, maybe 25 degrees that day. It hadn't snowed yet this year, but it had rained the night before, and it was overcast and it felt like snow was on the way. The deer would be out feeding all day ahead of the storm. However, there were no birds or squirrels or chipmunks moving around chirping or gathering before the storm. Maybe I had spooked them scrambling up the slope, but I was here before daylight and had been here for an hour. The critters should have been settled in and been moving. There were no other hunters within 25 miles of us, no other camps. We were always in camp a couple of days before the season and scouted both the two-legged and the four-legged critters in the area so we could plan our hunts in advance. I sat still and I waited. I glassed around the edge of the timber around the clearing with my binoculars, but there was no movement. I kept hearing a snapping and cracking of sorts now and then. I really didn't think much about it, but it was starting to warm up some, and high branches and cones would often fall from the trees as it thawed. And then there was a loud crack of a big tree branch close behind me somewhere on the other side of those jack pines. I jerked around and looked in that direction, but the jacks were only eight feet away, and I couldn't see anything. The sounds had the hair standing up on the back of my neck now, and I was getting nervous. I was taught to pay close attention to my natural instincts, but I hated to give up my perfect stand simply because I was spooked by sounds that I didn't understand. But that little deduction on my part would soon change. Five minutes later came the most gut-wrenching scream from that thicket behind me that I had ever heard. I had never heard anything like it since. I could best describe it as being the scream of a woman as clear and high-pitched as one could ever imagine. 
maybe at the opera, but it ended in a guttural growl that went all the way through me. I could actually feel it. It was not unlike the bass notes one hears from a hard rock speaker next to you at a concert, and whatever made this sound, it was close. I thought I was a big boy back then. When I was 12, I was 6 foot 4 inches tall and I weighed 210 pounds with a 13 size boot, but I was still just a kid. The very first thing I did was pee in my pants. The next thing I did was grab my Winchester and jump off that stump. It was a 10 foot drop and why I didn't break a leg I'll never know. I jumped in long strides down the incline to the trail, and I heard something, and I glanced back up the hill. The tops of the jack pines were madly swaying, and then, you be the judge, whatever it was ripped three of those ten-foot-tall pines out of the ground like you would pull a carrot from your garden and threw them one at a time down the hill over my head. I went about 50 yards or so and I stopped to jack around in my 2535 Winchester and I realized that the rifle wasn't near big enough for what might be following me. So like a newbie with a bad case of buck fever, I promptly jacked five more rounds out on the ground and ran as hard as I could for a quarter of a mile before I stopped for a listen. The timber was pretty heavy and I couldn't see anything. But not two minutes after I stopped, it let out another one of those screams. Not close like the first time, but it was dang sure loud enough to keep me moving. I made it back to the truck. I jumped in the back, leaned against the back of the cab, and I reloaded my little rifle with extra cartridges I had in my coat pocket, and I waited. I couldn't use my rifle in the cab of the old truck, and if that thing could pull those trees out of the ground like it did, it could rip the cab off that old truck to get me. So here I was, basically helpless. I stood in the back of the truck, and I tried to stop shaking. I was freezing now and hoped my pants would dry before the rest of the group returned. And then the ladies came walking up the old logging road about an hour later. I quickly turned and faced the cab to hide my still wet pants. Mom made some hot chocolate to bring along, and I had completely forgotten about it. I was still freezing, and I guess it showed. She said, come on, sit down for a while, and I'll get you something hot to drink. Do you want a blanket? I said yes to both and let the tailgate down on the old military truck, and I sat on that, keeping my legs together. She handed me the cup and pulled my legs apart, and then she looked at me. She turned her head for a moment, and then she handed me the cup and wrapped the blanket around my shoulders and put it across my lap. She asked if I wanted to get in the truck, and I shook my head no. I didn't say anything considering the way it went five years earlier. Everyone else showed up soon, and Dad asked if we had seen anything. Everybody said no. Dad and Mabe said that Inky hadn't jumped anything or struck a trail either. Everyone thought that was strange. Dad asked me if I was okay. Not answering a direct question from my dad never went well either, so I decided what the heck and I told them the whole story. Nobody said anything. They just looked at me, except my mother. She put her arm around my back for moral support. And then Dad said, you guys coffee up, I'll be back in a little while. I knew he was going back and check out my story, and he was going alone. I was actually afraid for him, but I knew it was no use. He couldn't miss those freshly pulled up trees laying in that field. He returned in about an hour, and his face was an ashen color. Mom said, well, what did you find? He didn't answer, of course. He just handed me back the ammunition that he had picked up from the trail where I had left it. And then he got in the truck and he said, come on, let's go. The others left earlier in the old military, so we were the last at camp. I cleaned up and changed clothes with only Mom knowing my plight, thank goodness. I was glad to hunker down in the chair around the fire. (laughs) 
I could see my dad talking to the others, but nobody spoke of it to me. Dad told me it must have been a big cat. He knew very well that I was not a liar, and he knew what it was. I know he did, but I can tell you it wasn't a mountain lion. I had been on these hunts for a while, and I heard many cats up to that point, and he knew that too. I couldn't understand why they all acted like they did, but they were in complete denial. Everyone except my mother. I didn't feel like hunting the next day. Mom and Lil stayed in camp and cleaned up and did some cooking. They put on a big pot of great-smelling beans and cornbread. It cooled off and started spitting snow about 9 a.m., and I kept busy cutting wood and hauling it into camp most of the day except for campfire breaks and hot chocolate. I kept the wood covered with an oil tarp so it would stay dry. Dad had his 12-gauge shotgun in the closet of the little 10-foot travel trailer they had by then, and there was no more sleeping on the ground. There was also a box of double-alt buckshot. I pulled out the plug and put five high-brass shells in the magazine and another five in my pocket, and I kept that shotgun within reach of me all day long. I also noticed my mom kept her 270 close, and also Lil carried her 3030 with her everywhere she went, but they never said a word about it. It wasn't necessary. The men returned later and they had killed two bucks. Both would go over 200 pounds. We had fresh chops for dinner that night, and tomorrow we would have liver and onions. The next day broke cold with four inches of fresh snow, and we needed water, so us guys took the military 4x4 down to a spring about five miles away. When we got there, I noticed Dad looking at something just about the spring. He was looking at some huge tracks. I could see them from where I stood. But these were 16 inches long and 10 or 12 inches wide. I'm telling you, they're the biggest tracks I've ever seen. Mabe followed those tracks to the edge of the road until they crossed the road and turned down the hill. The stride between the tracks was somewhere between six and seven feet. You could count every toe. Inky followed Mabe everywhere, but he wouldn't follow the tracks. He jumped back in the open door of the truck and stayed there. I said, Dad, what made those tracks? And he never replied. I said, Come on, Dad, I'm not seven years old anymore. You know those tracks are real. What the hell are those things? He said, well, they do for sure look like they're real, don't they? And I said, well, what do you make of it? And his only reply was, I don't know. Those were his last words on the subject, and we never talked about it again. A few years back at exactly 3 a.m. on a cold February morning, I decided to step outside and check out the stars in the dark night sky. I opened my front door and padded out barefoot down the walkway and out onto my driveway where I stood next to my parked cars. The sky was so dark you could see stars upon stars. As I looked to the east, there was a very bright light low in the horizon. I thought it was the lights from the tennis courts at a nearby park. But then why would the lights be on at 3 a.m.? So I decided to stand there and watch the lights. I couldn't tell if they were moving or not. They did seem to be moving, but very slowly. So I waited, barefoot, freezing in my lightweight pajamas. As the lights eventually got closer, I could see there were four lights across the front of this craft. I could not tell yet what it was. I couldn't believe it was coming straight from my area. The park is about three and a half miles from my house. In all, it took about 10 minutes for the craft to make it to where it would fly right over my house. It was as if it knew I was watching and waiting to see exactly what it was. At this point, I was absolutely frozen, both with fear and I was freezing. I decided to step back a few feet to the safety under the canopy of my large pine tree and step back out as the craft went overhead. As it got closer, I could not hear anything. 
this craft was absolutely silent. Add to that it was moving at an impossibly slow speed. When it finally got so close that it was overhead, I stepped out from the safety of my tree. I could hear what I thought sounded like fans. It was that close, just a few feet above the trees. And this thing was so huge. It was shaped like a triangle that was wider from wingtip to wingtip than it was long. I could see it only against the stars as it went over my house. Scared and freezing, I tiptoed back up the walkway and into my house. This memory has haunted me for many years now. I mentioned it once to my best friends. One friend said she saw the same thing years earlier. She described her encounter almost to the T as my encounter, except she was in her car early in the morning with her small children. There was other traffic in the road, and she wondered if anyone else saw what she did. Hearing her story made me feel normal. I'm glad that I'm not crazy. We live northwest of Area 51, and for the longest time, I passed it off as a test plane. But I don't think it was a test plane. Thank you for following along with this podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, click the like button, thumbs up, subscribe. All of it helps me. If you're listening on the podcast network, hit the follow button, give a thumbs up. I don't know what all these podcast apps offer in that regards, but I know you can follow or favorite or subscribe to a podcast. That would really help me if you did that. Hope you guys have a nice weekend. It's going to be a hot one. But we'll see you guys on the next one. I sure appreciate you. Thanks.